Welcome to NI Oil Studio. Today we are discussing on forces that influence social science curricula. I hope that you will have a basic idea about what is social science and uh, the contents of social science curriculum. In this uh, lecture, we will elaborate upon uh, the forces, uh, various forces that works upon a social science curriculum. Let me begin by reminding you that the social sciences was not a separate discipline before modern English education system began in the 19th century in India. We studied social sciences not separately but as a comprehensive whole with other subjects and that too when we consider the education in India before 19th century there was no formal education system at all. So hence we did not study social science as a separate entity. The colonial rulers designed courses in such a way that the British benefit by helping some Indians to generate a working knowledge about India so that they became efficient officers and clerks in the colonial government to serve them. So the British people when they came to India and conquered India, their main purpose was not to enlighten the Indian citizens, Indian inhabitants to enlighten their social science knowledge or to develop new knowledge in social sciences. Instead their agenda was to prepare servants for the colonial existence. In the course of time, national ideologies came in, ethos and ideals of India's freedom struggle came in and the values enshrined in the constitution after the independence uh, in the democratic India came in. All these influences before and after independence has influenced the social science curriculum that we come across today. So we can see that the social sciences that we learn and teach today is a big bucket in which uh, influences from different parts has contributed into it. In the course of time, many factors such as national ideologies, events and occurrences, various events and occurrences, say for example, various movements, environmental movements, various different other issues which happened across uh, our society and the national ideologies during the freedom struggle and then movements and revolutions against British people and then against uh, uh, the colonial powers and then conflicts and relationships, conflicts with uh, certain groups and then relationships which is established by India with some other people and then environment and resources of India like our huge environment, water resources, our uh, other metal resources and other resources, underground resources, etc., even human resources. And then ethos and ideals of India's freedom struggle and values enshrined in the constitution of the democratic India. All these factors influenced formation of a social science and thereby a social science curriculum to be taught in the schools and at colleges in India. So we can see that uh, social sciences uh, uh, that we learn today and that we teach today is the result of the, all the factors which we have discussed uh, in the previous uh, slide just now. Uh, let us discuss two important factors and if you ask me what are the two important factors that influence social science teaching and learning in India, I would say that they are colonial legacy and the nationalist perspective. These two factors have great influence on the formation of a social science curriculum in India. The curriculum uh, today aims at in fact enabling our students to understand the place they live in and land and people of India. So this is very important objective of our social science curriculum. Make our children to understand the place where they live in, the characteristics of the place where they live in and also to understand the features and the specialities of India 
and the place in which they live in especially and also about the natures and features of the flora and fauna including the people of India is an important objective of social science curriculum in our contemporary society. Also, social sciences enables our students to understand, understand about the rivers we have. As you know, rivers are great environmental resources. It provides water source for human being and its survival. Human being and its survival is not the only way that we use the resources. We use water resources for manifold purposes. And we know the mountains of India. They are another resources. And then different forests, different varieties of forests. We have uh, different large varieties of forests. And then agriculture, various types of agriculture, agricultural products, and then economic conditions of India. This is another important area where social science address different economic sources and economic conditions, distribution of goods and services, all this comes under economic conditions of India. And then population of India, as we know, it's an important phenomenon that we address with. And then religions of India is another important resource, at the same time a great cultural practice of India. And then government and many other features which uh, are contemporarily relevant and which has certain influence on human life and society are being discussed under the social science curriculum in our schools today. And let us look into what are the major factors which I have told you earlier. I listed the must to one is colonial legacy and the nationalist perspective. Let us look into colonial legacy first. It should be remembered that the colonial period contributed a lot to the development of social science curriculum in India. We cannot ignore it. Even if colonial rulers were exploiting our society, there were certain positive sides as well for the colonial rule. One positive side is that they have contributed positively a lot in developing social science as a curriculum, as a field of study in India. Even if they were having different objectives for that, it was the time when the social sciences began to emerge as a separate discipline and its curricular contents were selected. History writing does not have a very long tradition in India actually. It must be admitted that it was the British who first wrote history of India. We must admit this true that the Indian culture and Indian history does not have a habit of writing or documenting history. To a great extent, the colonial rulers and the colonial, colonial intellectuals who lived in India helped us to document the history of India, in fact. It was the colonial rulers who explored the length and breadth of India using modern scientific methods of survey and census. We were not using survey and census and then documenting the wealth and weakness of Indian society. This census and surveys helped in generating a whole range of facts, figures and data which were unknown to India and to the world as well. We were having a large number of resources, say for example the number of rivers in India. Pre-colonial India was having no idea about how many rivers were there in India. When the colonial rulers came to India, they listed the total number of rivers. They listed total number of uh, hills and mountains in India. They listed the flora and fauna of India. And Hortus Malabaricus and all this kind of great texts and then books are the results of such kind of listing. And even in case of languages, we were not having a dictionary of our languages at that point of time. In all these cases, we are indebted to colonial powers for providing us academic support for making a documentation of the, of the survey, do, making a documentation of the historical facts and figures and contemporary and social life of India. The colonial rulers mixed this rich knowledge with their own intention and purpose. That was the major factor that we have to notice. Even when they helped us in forming a great legacy of social sciences by listing 
our various natural resources and environmental resources and of course they have given an idea about the social life and historical facts of India, they were having a very specific purpose behind it. In spite of all this purpose, we admit the fact that social, social science curriculum of our modern day has been greatly influenced by the colonial rulers. A few British administrators and officials made conscious efforts to write the history of India. For example, in 1784, Warren Hastings appointed Sir William Johns, who was an officer of the East India Company, as the Chief Justice of Calcutta High Court and ordered him to write Indian history. William Jones, a man of remarkable intellectual goodwill, immediately founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal and on behalf of it, he embarked the task of writing Indian history. This was a great start actually. The efforts put forward by William Jones had the backing of many enthusiasts, including Indians and colonial people. His endeavor culminated in the publication of a periodical journal named as Asiatic Researchers, which started in 1788. The journal brought to light the researchers. This Asiatic research, which was established in 1788, brought into light the researches and surveys carried out by the society to make the public aware of the wealth of India. Later, several similar societies were started. For example, in Bombay, Chennai, such kinds of societies following the Asiatic societies have started. In 1833, James Prince became the secretary of the Asiatic society. This is a remarkable uh, point where Asiatic society has contributed to the Indian social science uh, field. His most eventful achievement is the development of a Brahmi and a Karostadi scripts between 1834 and 1837 and the identification of contributions of Ashoka. The contribution of Asiatic society of Bengal to reconstruct Indian history is well known today. It is accepted beyond differences of opinion. The colonial period also saw a number of attempts to discover and understand archaeological remains that led to reconstruction of Indian history. Full-scale archaeological surveys were facilitated when Kanningha, a second lieutenant of Bengal engineers, was appointed as the first archaeological surveyor from December 1861. The Archaeological Survey of India later became a distinct department of the government and spearheaded the archaeological survey and conservation activities in India. James Mill is credited with writing the first comprehensive history of India. Though he never visited India, he thought that he visiting India would disturb his objective views about Indian society and thereby that could be, that would make him biased about while writing the history of India. James Mill started his work in 1806 and completed it in 1818 by publishing the history of British India. Major General John Malcolm, memoir of the Central India 1824. Captain Grand Duff, his work is History of Madras, 1826. General Briggs, his work is History of Rise of Mohammedan Power in India, 1829. Mount Stuart Elphinstone, his work is History of India, 1841. And Joseph Cunningham, who wrote on History of Six, 1849, where some of the other writers who tried to write Indian history. East India Company established Survey of India in 1767 to explore the country bit by bit and to carry out mapping operation of military as well as civilian purpose. So their purpose was twice. One was civilian purpose and the other one military purpose. 
The Sauways become a rich source of information of India, India's land and resources. Such information became vital for developing natural resources for trade and commerce, for governance and for developing planning. Such information became vital for exploiting natural resources for them and not only for natural resources, for trade and commerce, for governance and for development and planning. The knowledge and information generated by the survey of the country provided new understanding of the land and its people, but all of it was done with a hidden motive. Census of India has become the single most important source of information about Indian people. Number of people living in our country, sex ratio, literacy and many other characteristics were exposed to by this census data. Such information has important implication for developing clear understanding of our society for British people. The census has played a great role in providing knowledge and understanding about Indian society to the British people. The first ever census was carried out in India was in 1872 by the British government. The next one took place in 1881 and after that census have been conducted regularly every 10 years. The knowledge, information and understanding generated by this successive census operations in this country provided valuable inputs for and influenced the social sciences curriculum in fact. Introduction of English education system in 1835 enabled Indian students to study Western science and technology and it exposed to them to a host of rigorous methods employed to study nature and society. The Woods Dispatch which was established in 1854 attempted to create a structure of modern education system in the country with elaborate arrangements for administration and management of different levels of education. Establishment of the first three modern universities in India, one in Bombay, now Mumbai, Kolkata and Madras quickly followed in 1857. The British government was also responsible for establishing a system of governance introduction of new systems of transportation and communication such as railways and telegraph. Establishment of rule of law and separation of the judiciary from the executive functions were other important developments of colonial influence. Simultaneously, a program for social reformation through provision for girls education, abolition of sadi, etc. were initiated. During this period, there was a renewed interest in India's culture and heritage also. Many of India's sacred and secular books of knowledge were translated into European languages and published throwing new light on Indian civilization. These languages were not only English but including a variety of languages like German, Spanish and all these different kinds of languages. Max Muller's work is a great example in which Indian the Vedic traditions and Upanishads were being converted, were translated into German language. Frederick Max Muller, I told you earlier, and the German Orientalist took a leading role in this regard. Max Muller's Sacred Books of the East is an example. All these developments in varied fields of archaeology, history, culture, heritage, survey of India's land and natural resources, population census, changes in India's governance, education, transport and communication and social reformation activities influence the social science curriculum and the way social sciences are studied. When the English education system was introduced in the country, the social sciences curriculum used a history of India as written by British writers. Now look into the nationalist alternative. The British government was thus busy in above mentioned activities in India which were done only with very clear aim to justify the British rule in India. 
the colonial rulers were looking forward to advance rational arguments to perpetuate or to continue their rule over India. This is evident from Rudyard Kipling's. For example, he wrote a book on white man's burden in which there is one such attempt to justify imperialism as a noble enterprise that white men should colonialize and rule other nations for the benefit of the natives of that nation. The British government tried to exaggerate the negative element in Indian life and culture and supposed superiority of the British and the European ways to show that the British rule is an inevitable uh, necessity of India. The Indians with the nationalist sentiments could not accept such kind of a position. They wanted the Indians to write their own history and interpret their own culture. The Indian nationalist reacted to the British way of interpreting India's history, civilization, culture and heritage. The nationalists felt that the British writers of Indian history attempted to overemphasize foreign invasions of India, negative elements in the social system such as caste system, practice of untouchability, sati, uh, etc. They forgo to dwell upon such British social science system on India, forgo to dwell upon subjects as to how Indians resisted the foreign invasions, remained resilient in the face of persistent aggression, the strength and vitality of social system that withstood the test of time for several millennia and how Sanskrit functioned as probably one of the earliest and the best lingual form thousands of years for millions of people in the entire subcontinent. The nationalist wanted to write the national history with a purpose to capture the ethos values and traditions of the nation that would foster a national identity. Swami Vivekananda was one of the first people, one of the first great men who stressed the need for writing Indian national history as seen through Indian eyes. Benkim Chandra Chatterjee, though an officer in the colonial government, strongly advocated for the cultural and religious revival in India. His Vande Madram has become a rallying point for Indian nationalism. In the meantime, many nationalist leaders were proposing alternative models of social development and social sciences. Gokhale demanded universal elementary education in the country. Maharaja Sayuji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda introduced a compulsory elementary education in his state. Mahatma Gandhi made an elaborate system of education which was called as basic education or Naitali in India. Several other nationalist leaders also took part in promoting the social system and the society in India. Swami Dayanand's Dayanand Anglo-Vedic movement was another important example. Arya Samaj, Brahma Samaj are, were some other examples. When the nationalist movement for freedom became mass movements, the social and economic views of the nationalists became strong alternatives along with demand for political power and full independence. Thus, the nationalist sentiments and alternatives extended a major influence on social science curriculum in contemporary India. We uh, conclude our discussion about major influences of social science curriculum in India with this. Thank you so much.